it's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use, or they can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com, Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customer surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. The following podcast contains explicit language. Hide your children. Hi, I'm Josh Levine, Slate's national editor, and this is Hang Up and Listen for the week of February 21st, 2023. Happy Mardi Gras. On this week's show, Kevin Van Valkenburg of No Laying Up will join us to talk about Tiger Woods' return to the golf course and the state of the PGA Tour versus Live Golf Battle. Claire Watkins of Just Women Sports will also be here for a conversation about a new equal pay fight in soccer, this time centered on the Canadian women's national team. And finally, Michael Bauman of Fangraphs speaks with us about all the rule changes in Major League Baseball, from the pitch clock to bases as big as pizza boxes. I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm the author of The Queen and the host of the podcast One Year. As previewed during last week's show, Joel Anderson won't be with us for a while. But alongside me, consoling me, is my pal, the pride of the Pelham Pelicans, and a guy who does not get picked last in the D.C. Senior Softball All-Star Draft. It's the author of the book's Word Freak, A Few Seconds of Panic, and Wild and Outside, Stefan Fatsis. Hello, Stefan. I actually didn't fact check that. Do you, in fact, not get picked last in the senior softball all-star draft? I do not. I think I'm like a, I think I'm a solid third, third round pick, fourth round pick, probably third round pick. You know, you got to get a shortstop early. You don't want to leave your middle infield with a big hole. I heard that five third round picks got traded for you. That's uh, that's the right number of third round picks. In our Slate Plus segment this week, we are going to revisit the end of the Super Bowl. Remember Super Bowl Chiefs Eagles? There's a penalty, some kneel down. Some of us thought it was unsatisfying. But is there a better way? Maybe, maybe there is. We'll discuss. Uh, but to hear that discussion, you need to be a Slate Plus member. You get bonus segments on this and other Slate shows. You get ad-free shows, and you get to support us. Slate.com slash hangup plus is the link to sign up. Slate.com slash hangup plus. Last week, Tiger Woods, who is 47 years old with his back and leg held together with tape and screws, showed up at Los Angeles' Riviera Country Club to play his first official public round without a cart since the British Open seven months ago. At a press conference last Tuesday, the writer Kevin Van Valkenburg asked Tiger if he could still enjoy teeing it up if he didn't truly believe he could destroy the competition. If I enter the event, uh, it's always to, to get a W. And I, there, there will come a point in time when my body will not allow me to do that anymore. And it's probably sooner than later. Um, but wrapping my head around that, that, that transition and being an ambassador role and just playing and just trying to be out here with the guys, no, that's not in my DNA. Joining us now is Kevin Van Valkenburg. He recently left ESPN to become the editorial director of the site No Laying Up. Kevin, thanks for being with us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. So, Kevin, Tiger finished 16 shots behind John Rahm, who won the Genesis Invitational to cement his position as the number one golfer in the world. But given that Tiger shot rounds of 69 and 67 at Riviera, it's fair to say that he's not yet a ceremonial golfer, to use a term that he himself seems to think is a grievous insult. Yeah, I think the surprising thing uh, for everyone who was in attendance was not that he uh, was able to play golf, but that he played golf pretty well. Uh, that even you know on Saturday, shooting a 67, people were like, wow, Like I did not think that was still in there. 
And, you know, he was better than a lot of people who are much younger and have a lot more uh, tendons or uh, bones that aren't fused together. So maybe Tiger's not quite done yet. I mean, I, some of the guys afterwards, some of his peers were like, he's going to win again. I guarantee he will win a tournament again. Uh, and I was surprised by that, even that, uh, you know, his peers were willing to go that far. But it's Tiger. I think we've learned that, you know, the expecting things to go in the normal aging pattern for him and expecting him to to just kind of fade away is not going to be how he's going to play it. Much was made, I guess, of the fact that he, not only did he shoot a 67 and a 69, Kevin, he seemed to be okay walking the course compared to last year when he limped a lot. Um, did he talk about what's changed in his uh, rehab and how much better he feels that he's able to do that now? He's always been very cryptic about the injury stuff and what exactly, you know, it is. He he talks about a lot about how his ankle is just, he can't push off the ground. He needs lots of ice baths and, you know, but he still talked about how, he, you know, he had to get a lift in before some of his rounds. Like, you know, he's, he's got a, a pretty yoked upper body if you ever look at like pictures of him you know, from even from when he was really great at golf to now, like he, it's dramatically different. So uh, he doesn't really want to get too specific. He just talks in sort of these broad terms of, oh, my, my team is working on me all night. You know, I'm, I have to take ice baths and then reactivate the muscles and then get back in the ice baths. And, you know, it's hard, it's hard, but you can also tell that he has like a kind of sadistic sense of pride when he's sort of telling you stories about like, see, I am a real athlete. Like I am, you know, just like all these other guys that, you know, golf, I was able to bring golf into the modern world in terms of athletics. And so I always kind of have a little bit of a smirk on my face when he starts talking about, you know, what a, what a grind it is because I, I do believe him, but I also think that he loves it a little bit. He loves being that guy. Can you give us a couple scenes, maybe one about the gallery and one about the fellow players, about just what it's like when Tiger Woods shows up at a golf tournament in 2023? So I have this theory that there are more like blurry, out of focus pictures and videos of Tiger Woods <laughs> exist in than of anybody on earth, like ever, because he came about at a time when phones were just sort of starting to kind of be ubiquitous and every single person who is in the gallery who's not like a media person is holding up their phone in this sort of awkward angle to try to get some sort of shot of him and I always think like do these videos ever get viewed again are they someone showing at like a birthday party like oh check out this picture of tiger that I got and it's like a little bit out of focus it could be the terrible. last shot he ever hits Kevin it's, it could be and so it's like covering the president right you never know what yes <laughs> it's really kind of uh, fascinating and I honestly think that it's whenever people say who aren't golfers, like, oh, you know, like, when are they going to like have other golfers besides Tiger? All you need to do is go to an event like this and see that for some people, it is really just not about the scores that he shoots or anything. It's golf is weird in that way that it's, it's about the emotional connection that people have to certain players. And he's just still the biggest planet in the whole solar system that for whom the gravity just gets pulled towards for all the people. And, uh, you know, you just see people who are like, I don't want to say there's like, we're weeping, but they're just so ecstatic whenever he comes by. They've been waiting in this spot, you know, the whole time where they finally got a spot right at the front of the rope line. And, you know, that to them, it's like, it's still like a, you know, like a Beatles situation. He's like Paul McCartney and they're just going to keep, you know, going to shows until it's over. And you mentioned that there was actually a pro who was not playing in the Pro-Am on Wednesday, I guess, who just followed Tiger around, like walked the course with him like he was a fan. Yeah, Aaron Rye, who's an English golfer, he's 27 years old. He's, you know, he's had some success on the DP World Tour. You know, he was, Tiger was one of the people who sort of inspired him to get into golf. And so he'd never met him and he was like, didn't want to go up to him and, you know, be like, hey, you know, it's, I'm really honored to meet you. He just kind of wanted to witness what it is to like watch Tiger Woods hit shots. And so... You know, in the in the pro am hierarchy, he was one of the guys at the bottom of the list who didn't get picked to go and play with like these executives or people who've paid like twenty thousand dollars to tee it up in a round where it's forty one degrees on Wednesday. And he decided like I'm just going to go out and I'm going to watch Tiger too. And and so yeah, after a few holes, like 
one of Tiger's people noticed him and was like, hey, like, aren't you Aaron Rye, like a golfer? And he was like, yeah. So come on over and meet Tiger. Like, come on and hang. And so he got to walk with Tiger for like, you know, eight holes or something. And that was just, he was like, that was the highlight of the week for me. And this is a guy who, you know, this is a huge event that pays out a lot of money. He finished, I think, in like the top 30, which is probably one of the higher like finishes. And he was like, that was my highlight of my week was meeting Tiger Woods and watching him hit shots. Tiger also reminded us uh, over the weekend that he is Tiger the the awkward joker um dad mm -hmm. joker sexist joker when he after out driving justin thomas on a hole he surreptitiously handed him a tampon implying that he is a woman because i hit the ball farther than you did justin um cameras picked this up and uh yeah and a little controversy ensued what happened there and how did tiger handle that yeah, Tiger, uh, as the, I think it was like a full day before, um, he faced the media again. So, so before it came out and, um, Claire Rogers of golf.com said, you know, Tiger, uh, you know, we all kind of saw what happened. What was your thinking behind it? And he gave sort of a, you know, mealy mouthed apology of like, if anyone was offended, you know, obviously I apologize. Uh, not like I screwed up and it was a dumbass thing to do, but like, if you happen to be, you know, have wronged in some way, I, I would apologize to you. That kind of thing. I, look, it was just, Tiger is someone for whom I, I think relationships uh, have been difficult throughout his life. I think a lot of that can be traced back to his dad. Uh, this very much was the kind of joke that his dad probably thought was hilarious. And that's where it sort of comes from in Tiger. And, and I, in a lot of ways, as we talked about this all through the weekend, and because, you know, when something like this happens, people who aren't sports fans, like all want to sort of talk to you, be like, what did Tiger Woods really do this? Like, you know, I, you know, people in my life who I hadn't talked to in years were like, Oh man, I can't believe were you there for that, that Tiger Tampax thing. And what I think is sort of, uh, what I always sort of tell him is Tiger Woods is kind of forever like a 16 year old boy. Like he sort of had his childhood traded away for golfing greatness. And so he's kind of stuck emotionally in that one spot. And so, you know, his all of his closest friends in golf now are people who are 15 years younger than him. And so I think emotionally he's more closer to their age. And that's why stuff like this is still funny to him. When Tiger was 21 years old, Charlie Pierce read a profile of him for GQ where Tiger told a dirty, off color, whatever adjective you want to use, joke. And that was a big deal when Tiger was 21 and kind of soured him on the media, right? It's funny to, I guess, funny in, in quotes, um, to see that we're still kind of having the same conversations about him as a 47 year old that we were as a, a 21 year old. Um, but Kevin, um, the guys at the top of the leaderboard, John Rahm and Max Homa, are ones who've chosen to stick with the PGA Tour, right? Um, there were some more defections to live this week of guys who most um, kind of casual fans aren't going to have heard of. But kind of what's the state of live versus PGA Tour right now? And what were kind of the conversations at Riviera among the players maybe about kind of where things stand as we head into the 2023 season? I think the people who stuck with the PGA, who are um, some of the top players, whether it's you know Rom or Rory or Scotty Scheffler or some of these guys, I think they feel pretty good about their position. I think there's a lot of rumors about Liv right now that you know some of the players are having a little bit of second thoughts, or they you know don't feel like things are quite um, as magical as they were sort of promised to be. Um, Have the checks not cleared? I mean, what second thoughts could they could they be having? <laughs> well, you know, in the first year, I, I know I can say this, in the first year, Liv basically picked up the check for everything that, you know, comes of travel, your caddy's travel, your family's travel, all that stuff. In the second year, Liv was kind of like, ah, uh, actually, we're going to give you like, like travel budgets and you have to stick to those. And it's not just a free for all for everything. And Liv did, you know, is going to go to Saudi Arabia for uh, one of its tournaments this year. And I think that a lot of the players hoped that would just be sort of a one off. Uh, they didn't really feel like, you know, there's nobody in Saudi Arabia who's like going out to watch golf. And so it's just to have like this huge big money event with, you know, that might as well be like a country club hit and giggle is not exactly like super, you know, exciting or growing the game. And nobody really loves, I think, going to Riyadh, you know, to play golf there. Um, so I think that there are some definitely like questions about, 
you know, when you can't even watch live live on its app, uh, it's going to be like tape delayed and, you know, who's going to like download the CW apps in order to watch the early rounds. And as long as like the public investment fund, uh, at the head of it, you know, Yasser al Ramayan and, you know, MBS are interested in using golf for whatever purposes they see, then it's going to keep going. But the thing I think is true in all this is like, it could all disappear in like a snap of a finger. They could just be like, yeah, we're done with this. We don't really care. And then there's no like, well, you still have to make good. Like who would really like say, well, I demand a meeting with MBS to sort of get the rest of my money. Like, I'm not sure, you know, that's going to happen. Uh, so, you know, there's the, one of the, in federal court, one of the things that just moved forward this week is that the, the PGA tour won sort of a thing that said that they could depose, uh, people as part of the sort of ongoing lawsuit that's going on. I don't think that, you know, the head of the public investment fund is going to want to sit for a lengthy deposition where it opened up to lots of other questions about, uh, what its purposes are. So it all kind of continues. The live golf starts up this week and they're playing at a kind of a lame course down in Mexico. And I don't think there's really any buzz. The, Obviously, they don't have someone like Tiger Woods for whom uh, people are really still drawn to. So, uh, you know, they didn't get the players that they kind of bragged about. Craig, Greg Norman said, we're going to pick off, you know, 10 to the top 20. And then he ends up signing Brennan Steele and Danny Lee and, you know, all these guys that you've never even heard of if you're not like a super golf diehard. So Liv talks a good game and never quite really delivers in full. And I think that's where we're sort of seeing in this year two is people are like, okay, really, this is it. You guys are, you're on the CW app. That's where we're going to watch you. Well, and that, that's the question that I would have. It's if they've already picked off everyone that they're probably going to pick off. And now we're talking about, you know, Brendan Steele and, and Thomas Peters. Um, that doesn't imply that there's a, a lot of growth potential here. At what point do the established golfers um, say, hey, the paychecks have been great for this year or two, but I want to start playing competitive golf week to week? Um, or does that not happen because the paychecks are too great and I'm just going to ride it out until Saudi Arabia pulls out of this? I'm just imagining Dustin Johnson like, wanting to leave because he has to submit res expense reports. Like, <laughs> I have to submit my rece receipts for travel? All right, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, if the I think there are people for whom if they could come back to the PJ Tour, they probably would consider it because they're looking and seeing like, wow, like there's so much money involved now in the PJ Tour. We've managed to, you know, I think John Rahm has won like almost 10 million in the last um, three events that he's won. Um, you know, he got something like four for that. I mean, Max Homa got, you know, I think it was 2 million for finishing second. And when he won this event two years ago, he got, you know, 1.9 million. So you're just showing like how much more money is in increased in the professional, uh, in the PGA Tour. But, you know, there's it basically the, the Jay Monahan, the commissioner, was basically like, if you go, you're never welcome back here. So I, I think they'd have to be some sort of like amnesty. I think. I mean, I think if like, you know, Bryson or Brooks, who are sort of two unlikable characters, said, and I don't have no idea like if they're mulling this, but if they said, yeah, we want to come back, like there would be a lot of guys who'd be like, you know, kick rocks. We, we don't need you. Like we're doing just fine without you. Uh, so, you know, it, there would have to be some real like, Forgiveness, but if that did happen, I think it would be, it would represent the collapse of Live pretty quickly. If you because it, there, it's all about narrative for them. Like if Dustin Johnson and Brooks Kepka and Patrick Reed or whatever was like, yeah, this didn't work out for us. Well, why would anyone want to watch it? They would just it would be even more of a laughing stock. So now that you're at No Laying Up, it's a golf site community. Um, what is your philosophy on covering Live? I mean, obviously you're going to cover the news of it, but. What is, are, are you going to have folks like writing and podcasting about the event in Mexico as a golf tournament? Yeah. So I mean, we have a, a super popular podcast. Uh, we have, you know, a, a YouTube channel and we're just sort of bringing back writing into the fold. Um, and that's kind of part of my role. And I think every week on our podcast, we sort of talk about like the week in golf. We have, you know, the most interesting stuff up front, but we always kind of talk about live and what's going on. There's no like, attempt to ignore it or pretend like it's not still part of things. And these live guys are always involved in for now in the majors. And so the sort of cross pollination of that makes for interesting drama that we end up talking a lot about them. And my job, I think is just going to be to like 
go and write where things are interesting. Uh, and you know, I don't, I'll probably go to one of the live events that's nearby me. I live in Baltimore. And so I'll probably go to the one in DC or the one in New Jersey, just to kind of see like, all right, is this a curiosity? And I went to the one in London last year was the first one. And that was kind of, I thought important to, uh, you know, at the time, give ESPN readers, which I, um, that's an insight into that. And, you know, now I'm writing for a, a community of people that truly care about golf above all things. They're not looking to click a, like a LeBron James story or something, you know, left of my dispatch. They're like, no, I'm here for golf. And so a way that's like kind of even, you know, more fun because you get to really, you don't have to kind of explain like what birdies and bogeys are. You're really talking uh, about the, the, the sort of sicko stuff of golfing, you know, whether a shock and start is fair or, you know, what a peel fade versus a, you know, a high draw is or stuff like that. So. All right. So last thing, let's just start, end with Tiger. He was pretty explicit about the fact that his goal at this point is to play the four majors to try to compete in all four majors. If you're like a tiger dead ender is Augusta, the, the big hope, like what, what is the kind of best case scenario or you know he's still trying to break sam sneed's record for most tournament victories like if you want to believe in hope in tiger woods what what are the kind of possibilities here and my supplement to that would be which of the courses for the u.s the pga and the british are uh most uh favorable to tiger this year so i would say the realistic goal i would think for tiger is it would help if he could like be in contention on the weekend at a major. I don't know that like he's quite ready to win one, but what you saw like the last time he had sort of, you know, he was coming back from a fused back was it really helped him to get in contention at the open championship at Carnoustie. And can't, you know, I think he finished second or third, uh, but he was in the mix for, you know, very much. And that kind of helped lead to what happened at Augusta when he did finally win. Augusta is just so smart about knowing uh, everything there that I think the way that the subtleties of the course can sort of, you know, don't miss here or use this ridge, this chip has to be this high, whatever. He'll always, I think, as long as he can walk, have a, a decent chance to shoot, you know, a couple good scores there. And if he can just sort of get a, you know, a, a, I think if the Masters came along where like the winner was, say, like eight under, I think Tiger could absolutely contend in something like that. If it's 17 under, like, I'm not sure he's got you know, a day, three days of shooting 65s. The interesting thing about this year's major rotation, we've never seen LA Country Club, which is where the US Open is going to be held. It's the same designer of, of Riviera Country Club where um, we just had that t- tournament. It's kind of opening its doors to the public for the first time like in its history. And so uh, it'll be really fascinating to see what that's like. Maybe it'll suit him and maybe not. I think it's a little bit flatter uh, than some things, but... Uh, the one I'm personally looking to is we're going back to Royal Liverpool, which is where Tiger won the British Open. And he did it famously by not having to hit like a single driver all week. It was so firm that he just hit irons off the tees and he kind of like outfoxed everyone who was like pounding the ball down there. And he was just like, no, I'm going to have seven iron in my hand when you have nine iron and I'm going to put it closer because I'm not going to miss in the wrong spots. And so I've played Royal Liverpool. It's pretty flat. Uh, it's very much a thinking person's golf course. It would be really cool to see him, you know, go back there and and sort of rekindle some of that magic. I'm sure that people are going to say, like, this is his chance, this is his chance when it comes because of how strategic and smart he was the last time he won there. Kevin Van Valkenburg is the editorial director of No Laying Up. Thanks so much, Kevin. You bet, guys. Up next, Claire Watkins of Just Women Sports on a new equal pay fight, this time in Canada. to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use, or they can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. 
The U.S. women's national soccer team has won its first two games at the She Believes Cup, beating Canada 2-0 and Japan 1-0, with all three goals scored by forward Mallory Swanson. The tournament's biggest story is one that will be familiar to anyone who's been following the team for the last couple years. It's the fight for equal pay. But now that fight is happening north of the border, with the defending Olympic gold medalists from Canada playing the tournament in protest and taking the field in shirts that read, Enough is Enough. Joining us now is Claire Watkins. She writes about soccer and a whole bunch of other sports for Just Women's Sports. If you want to keep up, you should subscribe to her newsletter. We'll link to it in our show notes. Welcome back, Claire. Thanks so much for having me. All right. So it was a natural question. What effect would the U.S. women's national team's success in securing equal pay have on other national teams and federations? What we're seeing now, Claire, is that it clearly inspired the Canadian women to push for the same treatment, but it's not clear at this point whether they're going to get the same outcome. Yes. Canada is in a very particular situation where it is a fight for equitable treatment, a fight for equitable pay. Their federation is also in some, in, 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 in let's say, interesting waters uh, financially. And it's also a fight for greater transparency. The, the Canada women's national team and the Canada men's national team have both pushed for further financial transparency from Canada soccer. And it will be interesting to see what the two teams together can get from their federation. Yeah, unlike the United States, Claire, um, you know, there's a, a similar pattern of the women being better than the men. Um, the, you know, the Canadian national team won the Olympics in last year. Um, they have been perennially successful at World Cups, um, always in the shadow of the U.S., but they were always much, much better than the men's team, even compared to the U.S., up until last year when Canada's men showed out great in, in World Cup qualifying, won the regional group before going to the World Cup and kind of bombing out. So... There's the parallel of the women being a lot better than the men, but everything is reduced in scale. There's just not the money in Canada. How are the can the Canadian women? What are they demanding? And is it similar to the demands that the U.S. women had in their long fight for pay equality? There are some similarities, and I think some, like you said, some very distinct differences. Uh, one being, I think there are two things happening with the Canada women's national team. One is, like I said, the thing that they are pushing for in um, cohesion with the men's team, which is greater financial transparency from Canada soccer in general, because Canada soccer has told both the women's team and the men's team that they are dealing with financial shortfalls. They need to cut funding. That conflict is is something that I think both national teams are pushing for together. Simultaneously, Canada women's national team has been very clear that they feel like they have gotten unequal treatment as compared to the men. It's kind of to your point. We didn't actually know what a Canada men's national team uh, World Cup looked like until last year. I don't think they had made the World Cup since the 80s. And what the women found out very quickly is that there was there were support, there was money, there was funding for that particular campaign that they had never seen before in their careers. And so suddenly they the kind of a, a light switch sort of flipped and they went, oh, you have the ability to support with this many training staff, this many people traveling, but you never gave us that before. And so they actually kind of got a blueprint for what the highest treatment Canada soccer is willing to give to a team because of the men's world cup last year. And they're kind of rightfully being like a little bit, you know, what the hell, why did we never get this? And why are we not getting this this year? The Canadian women boycotted training one day. Then there was a huge kind of conflict where um, the Federation said that they were taking an illegal, I guess, action, um, labor action. And so the team did come back and is playing the tournament under protest, but Christine Sinclair, the kind of talisman of Canadian women's soccer, has said they are not going to report for the April international window if this is not resolved. And the U.S. women have been in solidarity with the Canadian women. Can you kind of describe what the scene has been like at the tournament, both for the Canadian women, but for for all of these teams, because this is kind of a global fight. I'm actually wondering what like Japan and Brazil, the other teams are, are thinking of this as well. It's a good question. The U.S. is the standard. The collective bargaining agreement that the U.S. successfully signed this year is one of it's it's one of one 
uh, no other women's national team is getting equal pay, equal treatment from a from a federation, while also you know it g- dives into salaries, compensation, prize money. The U.S. kind of stands alone here, and I think they understand that and are n- trying to be very careful not to advocate for the exact same negotiating tactic that they took. However, one of the things being happening here with Canada playing under protest is they were reportedly threatened with with litigation. Uh, their federation, uh, according to the Players Association, threatened to sue players. And and the Canada's players also say they have not been paid for all of their work in 2022. Like I said, there are, there are many things happening here that imply that the financial responsibility being taken by Canada soccer is not being stewarded very well. But across the board, even in England, we saw there is a, a similar friendly tournament happening in England right now. They wore the purple, the purple wristbands that signified that they were playing in solidarity with Canada. I think there is this always this understanding with union-based national teams that you are sometimes limited in what you can and cannot do. I believe that the the strike that Canada took um, was considered illegal because of the wildcat nature. I think if they needed to give a little bit more um, notice to, to, to Canada's federation in order for that to be legal, which is why they're able to signal that if in April, if they haven't been paid, if negotiations haven't improved, they don't have to play. But for the U.S., I think they they have the ability, having won some considerations, to take a stand. And then from Brazil and Japan, I think you see teams that are in a similar fight, maybe a little bit less confrontational. They are still pushing for higher standards, pushing for higher support, supporting Canada as well, because they are the next team to take a little bit more of a, a combative approach. Brazil, years ago, was in a terrible fight and raised um, all sorts of allegations and gave examples of the neglect by the corrupt Brazilian Federation about their treatment. In Japan, the current fight seems to be about attention and respect given to the team. Very little social media posting for the uh, from this tournament, the She Believes tournament. Um, no broadcast coverage available in Japan. There's that sort of general level of frustration. And it's worth remembering, Claire, that it took the U.S. women six years of fighting against the U.S. Soccer Federation and federal lawsuit, which they lost uh, before reaching this landmark agreement after the U.S. Federation replaced its director with a former women's national team player that guarantees equal pay for individual matches um, and sharing more revenue from the respective men's and women's World Cups and getting the men on board for that. Um, Canada, obviously, as we've discussed, doesn't have those kinds of resources. They don't have the resources for a fight the way the U.S. women did. Um, the, the current collective bargaining agreement is pretty weak. They don't have giant sponsors. They don't even have a full-time Players Association director. Um, so how much of this does come down to, and I hate to put it in these terms, getting the full support of the more successful recently, the the team that's gotten more attention and more revenue, the men, to sort of getting into the same space that the U.S. men did, saying, we want this to be an equal 50-50 share deal. It's going to be very important, just frankly. Um, Like I said, there are sort of two things happening. One being unequal treatment as compared to the men's team. There has been a little bit less public discussion of that from the men themselves. I'm sure that those conversations are happening behind closed doors. But where the women's team and the men's team are united, and it will be very interesting to see what leverage they have with the Federation, is in that greater financial transparency. A lot has been said about Canada's deal with that Canada soccer business company, which takes revenues from the national teams. Those owners are part of the Canada Premier League. It gets very complicated in terms of the the business there. But ultimately, what both teams are saying is we're seeing unprecedented success. As you said, we won an Olympic gold medal and the men's team made the World Cup for the first time in almost 30 years. Where is that revenue going? Why are we not seeing greater investment? Why are we seeing funding be cut for not only the first teams, but youth teams? Why is there no youth team programming? Why is there no women's national team programming before a World Cup? They want answers to those questions before they even can start to make demands about what they want in terms of that funding to be, you know, robust and and pushing towards the future. So I think that part of the fight, it's instrumental that the women and the men are very, very clear and constantly in communication because they both want those answers. The women's team, I think, 
bears the brunt of those financial issues. And so it does take solidarity from the men's team to put that at the forefront in addition to the men's team's own concerns. And this being a World Cup year, it does seem like in some sense, this is kind of getting out in front of an issue, publicizing an issue um, that is going to get more attention in the months to come because that is really the moment. And maybe for a federation like Canada and for some of these other countries, the only moment when they have a big international platform to make the demands um, that they've been making and have them actually be heard and have the federation actually care and be under pressure to to do something. But, you know, the, the difference, I, I think, Claire, with the U.S. women's national team is that unlike so many of these fights for fair treatment and fair pay in women's sports, there was actually money to distribute in that case that wasn't being distributed, that they were actually fighting over real dollars. I mean, I, I think about something that you've been covering a lot, which is the fight over charter flights and the WNBA. And the conversation there has been, I mean, maybe you would disagree. I'm curious for your take. I I feel like it's been actually kind of transparent where the league has said, yeah, this would cost $50 million. So like, let's have a real conversation about who's paying for that and and how. Um, But there's a real fairness issue there. Like there, there are charter flights in the NBA, but not in the WNBA. But like, how are we going to address that and and deal with it if, uh, according to the WNBA, the money is not there? Like, then it becomes a harder conversation. Yeah. um, I think always with women's sports, you, again, have sort of two things happening. One is resources and one is attitudes. And I think the resources conversation is a legitimate one, um, always. Revenues are building, support is building, but we are talking probably, at, at, obviously, at a smaller scale than the established men's sports leagues. And to be fair, you know, the WNBA is 26 years old. The NWSL is 10 years old, much newer leagues. We're looking at uh, leagues in their infancy sort of making these uh, grown-up decisions that the, the, men's t- the men's leagues also had to do at that point in, in their histories. But... Um, Yeah, I I think you're right. I think it's always that's why the the push for financial transparency is so important, because if we're dealing with actual business issues, you can have that conversation. If you're dealing with antiquated attitudes about women's sports, then that's a much trickier conversation to have, because one side of the table is arguing for potential and what can happen next. And you might have the other side of the table arguing about what's happened in the past or you know, different ideals about what these women's leagues can be. And I think, again, it ties back to Canada. I think it ties back to every single time you see women's sports teams or women's sports unions fighting for treatment or investment. It's, are you finding resistance to this because the resources themselves are an issue? Or are you finding resistance to this because we're dealing with attitudes that aren't willing to to put money on the line to see something grow. Well, and and that is, I think, the central question during the World Cup year, because the organization that has the greatest ability to ensure growth in women's soccer is FIFA. Um, They're going to run a World Cup where the prize money pales in comparison to the Men's World Cup, and FIFA could change that and change the course for not just the Canadian women's national team, which is one of the better teams in the world historically, one of the earliest uh, women's football teams that had success on uh, on the world stage. Um, and what, I, what I'm curious to see is how, whether this local solidarity between the U.S. and Canada, particularly around the She Believes Cup, can sort of transmogrify into something broader involving way more teams at the bigger Women's World Cup that is going to take place this summer. Can you envision a a scenario where the English and the Dutch and the German and the African and South American teams stage some sort of collective demand action at the tournament in Australia and New Zealand this summer? Absolutely. I mean, we've seen, we saw in the 2022 World Cup, some of the limitations of of what FIFA will allow, right? I think increasingly you're going to see that friction. If we saw it with the Men's World Cup at the level that we did, I think you're similarly going to see it at the Women's World Cup. Um, FIFA has talked about partnering with Saudi Arabia for the, for the Women's World Cup. There, you do see sometimes uh, the 
the the message of the teams themselves getting kind of lost in in the greater uh, approach that FIFA has taken with the Women's World Cup. And like you said, it's suppressed revenues. There are questions. There are so many questions about the way FIFA treats the women's game. Um, well, it's hard to I get think- your it's hard to get your own affirmative message out if all you're doing is like playing defense against the terrible stuff that FIFA is doing. Like I think you know Alex Morgan and others are talking about like why are they looking at sponsorship from Saudi Arabia. Like it would it'd be easier if there was like clear playing field in front of them to talk about the things they wanted to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and I, but I will say that it's not, it, it is both a credit to these players and a frustration that they have to do it that in the women's side, they're very used to compartmentalizing this. Uh, I think we, this is maybe the, the issue, the situation with Canada is a very, very good example. The U S and Canada are arch rivals. They don't like each other on the field. They, they, they play each other fiercely. Canada got the better of them at a major tournament. The U S is trying to erase that history, that, that recent history against Canada. And yet they are frequently club teammates. They are people who know each other very, very well due to their proximity. And, those teams are very, very good at focusing on the bigger picture and then placing that aside when they step on the field. And so I would anticipate whatever teams are allowed to do during the World Cup, they understand, these women understand that this is their greatest platform. The World Cup every four years is absolutely the most eyeballs they are going to get um, during this cycle. And they are very clear on not letting that go to waste, kind of like in the Canada situation, if they are playing. If they have to play under the circumstances that they are playing, they're going to use that platform to raise public support for the things that they care about. The finales of the She Believe Cup um, come on Wednesday. The U.S. is playing Brazil in Texas, and we'll be watching that. And we'll be reading you, Claire Watkins, in Just Women Sports. Uh, again, a reminder to subscribe to Claire's newsletter. It's great. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, Claire. Yeah, of course. Thanks so much for having me. Up next, Michael Bauman of Fangraphs on new baseball rules. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, when you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company & Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Other credit cards often charge annual fees for access to perks you might not even use, or they can come with restrictions. Apple Card gives you valuable benefits without annual fees. In fact, there's not a single fee at all. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 15.24% to 26.24% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of January 1st, 2023. Pitchers and catchers and other players, too, began reporting last week to Major League Baseball spring training camps in Florida and Arizona. In addition to stretching, shagging fly balls, and other grueling preseason rituals, players will be adjusting to the biggest crop of rules changes in decades. They include supersized bases, which Red Sox manager Alex Cora compared to a pizza box, a ban on infield shifts, and the introduction of a pitch clock that not only could speed up games substantially, but also increase the number of balks. 
Balk fever. Catch it. Michael Bauman writes for the baseball website Fangraphs. He is with us now. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Michael, in a piece at the end of last season, you gave MLB an A for the new rules and said that the pitch clock involved the most significant rules changes of the past 50 years. The designated hitter was enacted by the American League in 1973, so perfect timing there. So let's start with the clock. Remind us how it'll work and who's likely to be affected the most. Well, the short version is pitchers can't just hold the ball forever. Uh, so once they get the ball back from the catcher, uh, the pitcher must begin his motion within 15 seconds with the bases empty or 20 seconds with uh, if there's a runner on base. And there are restrictions on when the batter has to be ready to receive a pitch. Uh, there are limits on the number of dis- quote-unquote disengagements. So that's when the pitcher takes his foot off the rubber. So this limits the number of pickoff throws. And this is a reaction to just the, the stretch in the amount of time that the ball is dead and out of play in the pitcher's hand on the mound. And it's just, it created so much dead time, took so much air out of the atmosphere of baseball games. And the headline number has always been about when they tried this in minor league baseball, it it shaved something like 20 minutes off the the average game time. That's less important to me than just keeping the game moving. And uh, the impact for this, you know, there are a bunch of downstream effects, but just the improvement in just like keeping the game ticking over. I think has to be has the potential to be uh, enormously positive for uh, for baseball as an entertainment product. Yeah, Bill James said in 2001, the problem with long baseball games isn't the time they take. The problem is that the wasted time inside baseball games dissipates tension and makes the games less interesting, less exciting, and less fun to watch. As Stefan alluded to in his intro, what will be fun to watch is players trying to adjust to these rules. So there's no one in American life uh, who has more kind of ingrained habits than uh, the baseball player. I guess international life as, as well. So... What is the typical time now that pitchers take to pitch and that batters take to get in the batter's box? And what are you kind of anticipating? Are Do you think that they'll adjust to this quickly? Or are pitchers just going to be um, totally out of sorts for uh, a long stretch of time here? Sorry, to go back to your first question, the way that like baseball savant and fan graphs measure time between pitches isn't the same as the way the pitch clock would um, would end up being implemented. So they're you know, or instance of pitchers who take on average like 30 seconds between pitches. It isn't quite that extreme. But Kenley Jansen has a reputation for being one of the slower pitchers in baseball. He's been in the major leagues for for more than 10 years now, and he is skipping uh, the early rounds of the World Baseball Classic, where he was slated to pitch for uh, Team Netherlands. And uh, so he can pitch under these circumstances in spring training and, and get used to it. So I think the fact, you know, when we think about rule changes, this is something that's it's a white line. You know, there's black letter law about this. It's not something like cut, trying to cut down on obstruction in hockey or, uh, you know, changing pass interference calls. It's not something the players can really push back against the umpire and, you know, force the umpires to negate it. They have to adjust or they're going to get automatic balls or automatic strikes called against them. And I think everybody's basically accepted that this is going to happen. You know, there's the the 11 person competition committee uh, has four players on it and all four of those players voted against the pitch clock. But I think they accepted that this is just something that's going to happen. And, you know, it's not going to be that huge of an adjustment on a pitch to pitch basis. It's called the pitch clock, but the batter is also yes. going to be affected in a huge way. I mean, you just think of like the no more Garcia Parra types who are constantly readjusting their batting gloves and Velcroing and adjusting their pants and their shirts and their chains. And you realize that this has been one of the banes of the game, too, just watching dudes stand outside the batter's box and taking forever to get in. So that's one. And the second, I think, and most interesting downstream effect that um, we're going to have to wait and see what happens is this data that indicates that relievers are, A, slower than starting pitchers in terms of the time it takes them to deliver, and B, the extra time often allows them to recover because they're throwing at max 100-mile-per-hour velocity. And, you know, at this point, Michael, do we have a sense of, like, whether relievers having to go quicker is going to curb their velocity a little bit, which is one of the intended effects here is to get more balls in play and get 
you know, more people on the on base paths. That's something I think we're not going to have a sense of until maybe as late as midsummer, uh, just because of how long it's going to take all these guys to ramp up to full strength. But that's one of the things I'm most excited about, because one of the the big problems that I've had the past few years with baseball as again, an entertainment product is too many strikeouts. It's not enough balls in play. And a lot of that is informed by the tendency in roster construction. We know so much about pitching now. We can just build guys who throw 97 with a killer slider, you know, guys who would have been, you know, all world closers 20 years ago. They grow on trees now. And part of that is they have the ability to throw every single pitch max effort. And so, a field, a set of rules, you know, that is 60 feet, six inches between the, you know, the mound and the plate, all that's set up for somebody who's pacing himself, somebody who's trying to run a mile, basically. And now we're running a four by 400 relay and the batters just can't really adapt to it. So I hope that there is some kind of effect to that. You know, the, the relievers have to pace themselves because I do think the the heavy reliance on the one inning reliever uh, is detrimental to the game. And, you know, there have been concessions in this new rule set to that. But I do think that, that this is a necessary pushback. And I'm glad that MLB is taking that that measure. So big picture thought that I will zoom back in on our, our next rule change that we're going to discuss um, in a second. But um, as you've kind of been alluding to, Michael, the tension here is between baseball or any sport as an entertainment product versus uh, baseball or any sport as a competition. And I, I think you can see it most clearly in baseball or more clearly than in, than in other sports, how this emphasis on competition has had a negative effect on entertainment or, you know, different people have different views on that, but that these things are intention and in balance. And it's just so fascinating to me that as fans, uh, I think, and even as consumers, what we think we want is teams to try to win. There's so much con- consternation about things like tanking and things where winning isn't um, seen by teams as an optimal strategy. But in baseball, the focus on, you know, home runs leading to more walks and strikeouts, the the shift, um, which I think we'll talk about next, this emphasis on relievers who throw really hard. It's all because teams want to win. And the game has evolved in this Darwinian way such that winning strategies proliferate and make the game less entertaining and less fun, both because um, you have fewer stolen bases and fewer you know, hits and things that fans like to see and that we kind of grew up watching, but also because in a lot of ways, the game is kind of the same. Like everybody, as they optimize, kind of pursues a similar strategy. And so I wanted to talk about the shift because it seems like as opposed to the pitch clock where I don't see that much of a downside, banning the shift seems like an imperfect solution to a real problem, in my view. I'm curious what you think about it, Michael. I think that's a fair way to put it. When we talk about banning the shift, I think that understates the amount of defensive flexibility that teams will still have under these rules. Basically, they just have to keep the keep all four in, infielders on the dirt and they have to keep two of them on each side of second base. And just in your head, you can imagine how much flexibility that gives you know, you could have a shortstop lining up almost exactly behind second base. So the things that are banned that teams were implementing are three players on one side of right. second, ba- second base for lefty fields. hitter, yeah. guys playing on the grass, to, right. uh, things like that. The big thing Infielders is, playing on the grass. The big thing is, right, what you said, the second baseman playing basically in short right field with a, when a left-handed power hitter comes up. And, you know, I was a, a Phillies fan when Ryan Howard was one of the big left-handed power hitters who first started getting shifted. And maybe it's because of that that I've just had a visceral aversion to, you know, that 110-mile-an-hour line drive right at the second baseman playing 50 feet behind the, the dirt. But I think we want to reward hard contact. And so... It, I think there was an expectation that when the shift became more uh, more common, that hitters would learn how to go the other way. And we've had more than a decade now. And, you know, that was my hope, too. And we've had more than a decade of evidence that that's just not going to happen. It's just so hard to hit a pitched baseball, let alone hit, hit it where you want it. You have to be Ichiro or Tony Gwynn to be able to do that reliably. And so... Like you said, Josh, it's it's an imperfect solution to, uh, to I think, a, a very real problem. And there does seem to be some division on which kind of players will benefit. But I think that 
this is sort of a squishy measure of it, but stuff hits that look like they should be hits will more frequently turn into hits now. Uh, and, you know, I think that's on balance a pretty good thing. But Stefan, when the shift kind of first started to come into the game, I think it was seen as fun and innovative, right? Like there is something kind of fun and wacky if you grew up watching baseball in the 80s like I did, seeing three players on, you know, one side of second base. And it was this, you know, the teams were thinking differently and not being like, you know, it, it wasn't hidebound. They weren't like being conventional. And it's just been interesting to see the shift from that to like, everyone does it now and we need to ban it. It happened very quickly, like in the long arc of baseball history. Yeah, it did. I mean, look, they were shifting Ted Williams, right, for a time. There there are examples over the course of baseball history, but certainly not at the level that we've seen in the last decade. As with everything else, we expected the sport to adjust, just as the fielding strategy adjusted to deal with more left-handed hitters driving the ball predictably to the right side, you would have thought that once that was cut down, as you were alluding to, Michael, that that left-handed hitters would learn to exploit the opportunity given to them on the left side of the field. But it didn't happen. The numbers are dramatic. The left-handed hitters' batting average on balls in play, BABIP, was 282 last year, which was the lowest level in 50 years. Um, And, you know, in 1973, the designated hitter was brought into baseball to help juice offense. And now we're at the same point, and now we're just seeing a different solution to trying to juice offense. But, Michael, what I think is interesting, I mean, the the spillover effects here are, like, who's going to play? Like, what kind of a shortstop or a second baseman do you want? What kind of an outfielder do you want? How much flexibility and mobility do you want in in field? You don't want to put a slow guy at second base, which we have seen from time to time in recent years, because he's going to need to get into the into right field. And our manager's willing to position the left fielder in short right field and tempt left-handed hitters like Anthony Rizzo or Kyle Schwarber to try to go that way in ways that they haven't been able to even up till now. So I, I like the idea of trying to see what people come up with to circumvent this rule. I don't like the idea of forcing players to stand in particular places, but there is wiggle room in the rules such that teams will have the opportunity to experiment. I think that's a good point. That It doesn't cut down necessarily on on unorthodox defensive alignments. For instance, the five-man infield is still in play, which you see every so often in you know late and close situations. But I think it makes it riskier. Like this is the shift was something that you could just do and basically get away with without risk. And now, like if you want to pursue those marginal advantages, you have to completely redo the calculus. And I think it's okay to make managers and you know the front office analysts who who make these decisions, you know, recalculate every so often, particularly because, like you said, the the convergence uh, that, that we've been seeing over the past 10 years, it's been, you know, it's made the game, you know, I think predictable in a way that, that could stand to be shaken up. So the larger bases out of all the rules, I guess Ghost Runner as well, larger bases is the one that I think is going to subject the sport to the most amount of ridicule. We've already seen it with them being referred to by a manager has pizza boxes, not somebody who uh, is uh, in the business of even wanting or trying to, to ridicule the sport. But my question about that is, you know, based on the stuff you've written and other stuff I've read, it seems like the effect of having a slightly larger base on whether it's stolen bases, whether it's guys being able to beat out a, a grounder to first base, it seems so negligible that I wonder why the sport would subject itself to the ridicule of like the pizza box characterization if it's just like doesn't have much of an effect at all. I don't think the the ridicule is going to be that big. I mean, it's one of those things that they could have just implemented this and not told anybody and nobody would have noticed, uh, you know, except maybe a second baseman. I think the way that, that they've sold this is mostly is an injury prevention thing that just if the 
the the fielder with his spikes and the the base runner your base stealer with his hands if they're fighting over more real estate there's less chance of somebody getting spiked or getting stepped on or you know uh, rolling okay. an ankle and so you know if i were writing this rule i would have had larger bases but i also would have had the slow pitch softball style double first base to try to eliminate some of those collisions down the uh the first baseline so the runner runs to a different first base than right. the fielder is standing on and it does. It just seems like there's so little to lose by doing this. And the you know we all had our fun with the all the reporters going around taking pictures of the the two bases next to each other. But when you look at it in the context of a entire baseball diamond, I, I don't think you'll ever notice watching on TV. Which you know, I would love it if if this led to a little bit more base stealing. I love everybody loves base stealing, uh, but I think that this is going to be one of those things that's going to make for a lot of funny photos, and then we'll we'll, we'll forget it happened by May. Yeah, I think a lot of the writing about, like, will this change the bang-bang play at first base feels like it is just not worth even, like, discussing. I mean, yeah, it's three inches closer to home, but the first baseman is also three inches closer to the fielded ball when he's receiving it. And Um, how often does the hitter, you know, hit the first three inches of the bag anyway? Right. So... Right, right, right. All right, the last thing quickly that we should hit on is MLB implementing permanently the rule that every half inning in extra innings begins with a player on second base, a runner on second base. This does feel like a solution in search of a problem. There weren't that many extra inning games. It doesn't really tire out players that much to play extra inning games. Nobody was clamoring for 10-inning or 11-inning games instead of 12 or 13-inning games. This is the one that feels like much more than a larger base opens baseball to ridicule. And we've had it for experimentally for two seasons. I think everyone's forgotten that it even exists and it's become part of the sport. But it does reflect what our friend Tom Lay, uh, writing in Defector, pointed out was that this is the one thing that sort of goes against the values of the game, the core value of the game, um, that it does change the game while it's being played. I agree. And uh, yeah, I've never been a fan of this. I'm a fan of the absolute sicko 18, 19 inning games, which we're never going to see anymore. And that was when we really saw baseball get weird. You know, players hit playing in unorthodox positions, position players pitching back when that was still a novelty. Uh, and of course, this rule, as my colleague Jay Jaffe wrote uh, the other day, is coupled with a you know, more prohibitions on when position players can come and pitch. Uh, you know, it seems like Two things. One, the constituency for this rule feels like beat writers who just want to get out of the bar before last call, which, you know, I can appreciate. But, you know, nobody with the power to speak up against this really has a vested interest in doing anything but making baseball games shorter. And so it seems like a pity for that reason. Uh, and also it just and completely really cha- do that. And it changes the the run environments. So when the, the game is most in the balance, too. And uh, yeah, it's. I don't know how much of a purist I, I really am about uh, baseball in general, but this in particular just feels like, like you said, a solution in search of a problem. And But one of the, the issues is these bullpens, like I was talking about, bullpens are built towards one inning relievers now, and teams are using them earlier than ever. They're going harder than ever. They can't go as long as they could before uh, relief pitchers, and they're running out of pitchers. They only, you know, they don't have let alone, you know, they don't have 13 innings worth of pitchers on a major league roster, let alone 18 or 19. You know, my friend Craig Goldstein, who uh, is the editor of Baseball Prospectus, has made a good point about this. It's like, that's a choice. And it's a risk you take with your roster construction. And you should be punished for that risk if it goes wrong, rather than bailed out by a rule change that's going to determine the, you know, determine the course of of uh, you know, the way these games go, like I said, when they're mo- when the leverage is highest. And so that's, it's a pity, but also it's one of those things that that I've realized I'm you know I'm on the losing side of this, and and as soon as they implemented it in 2020, everybody who wanted to go home early was like, oh, this is great. Then there was really no coming back from that. I kind of bridle at any uh, invocation of baseball's values, uh, Stefan, but it does seem like it's contradictory. In that, you know, what the pitch clock does is it cuts out the boring parts of the game. What this does is it cuts out the exciting parts of the game. It reminds me of the debate over five sets versus three sets in Grand Slam tennis. The argument that the three set people make is that you want the dramatic end of the match. You just don't want the, you know, set three and set four. You're you're keeping the quote unquote fifth set 
tension even in a shorter match. In this case, you know, when you really want to tune in is a close and tight game at the end. And they're just saying, all right, this is the part that we need to cut short rather than like the third through the sixth innings. But there's also this counter argument I've seen and Tom Lay makes it that like, all right, why don't we just have tie games? If you're just going to like yeah. ruin or adulterate the extra innings like this, we should just have tie games. The people that are making that argument, I think, I don't think it's disingenuous, but I feel like if that was actually implemented, people would get even madder. They would get like way madder than they get about the ghost runners. So I just, I, I think that that is not actually the solution. But like 17, 18, 19 inning games, that's really, as somebody whose interest in baseball has attenuated, you know, myself, that's like one thing that I would tune in for. In addition to like no hitters, perfect games, the potential for a four home run game. And then if it's like an 18 inning game, this just like is going to actually cut down my interest. It's going to make me less likely to watch a regular season baseball game now that the possibility of a game like that no longer exists. Yeah, two two things that are guaranteed fun for a viewer or a highlight watcher are a position player pitching, throwing a 55-mile-an-hour EFIS ball, and two, an 18-inning game. And baseball has decided that those rare but fun things we should have less of. I've, lived, I've sat through multiple 14th inning stretches live, and I can tell you there's nothing quite like it. And I'm, I'm sad we don't have those anymore. Michael Bauman writes about baseball for the website Fangraphs. Michael, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. And now it is time for After Balls, sponsored by Bennett's Prune Juice, endorsed by Kenny Sailors, who says it was okay. Five-time NBA All-Star Marcus Johnson turned 67 earlier this month, and on Sunday he posted his annual I Can Still Dunk a Basketball video, which we've talked about on this show before. This year's attempt was shot for reasons unexplained at the home of younger former NBA All-Star Gilbert Arenas, the 6'7 Johnson who won an NCAA title with UCLA in John Wooden's last year as coach and then played 12 seasons in the league, mostly for the Bucks, rocked a pair of Arenas' Agent Zero signature shoes and started the video wearing a Letterman jacket from his high school alma mater, Crenshaw, in L.A. Before we listen to Johnson narrate his attempt, we should note that the NBA Slam Dunk Contest was won on Saturday by Mac McClung, the 6'2 former Georgetown and Texas Tech guard. This year, he's averaging 19 points per game for the Delaware Blue Coats, the G League affiliate of the 76ers, who did sign him to a two-way contract just a few days before the dunk contest. Also, Mac McClung is white. Now look, NBA dunk contest, Mac McClung, we're paying homage to Mac McClung. I'm Black McClung, right? He had on the Gate City High School jersey. I'm rocking the Crenshaw Championship jacket. That's right. I'm rocking the Crenshaw 50th anniversary blue and the gold. That's right. And then underneath this, of course, UCLA. Gilbert may not like that, but hey, who cares? And then underneath that, boom, 1980. All-star jacket. Now, the eight used to be a lot more visible, but hey, it's been 40 years. What do you want? <laughs> All right, here we go. Hey, all right, guys. Let's do it. You think I can get this done? Hans huh, Josiah, huh, Gil? Yes, sir. All right, regulation all hoop, regulation we court. <laughs> here we go. Let's go! That's right. Black McClung. Black McClung joins the pantheon of race-based basketball nicknames alongside Jason Williams's White Chocolate, 
Earl Monroe's Black Jesus, and former Penn player and current Iowa coach Fran McCaffrey's lesser-known White Magic. I mean, it could be recency bias, but I feel like Black McClung is kind of has to be on some sort of Mount Rushmore of something. <laughs> I'm not sure what yet, but it's just uh, amazing coinage. Thank you, Marcus Johnson. Oh, he's a legend. Josh, what's your Black McClung? In our conversation with Michael Bauman just now, we talked about the now cemented Major League Baseball rule where starting in the 10th inning, each team begins its time at bat with a runner at second base. Most people are calling it a ghost runner, and loyal listeners with great memories might remember that Stefan Fatsis himself did an afterball about that term way back in 2016. As he said back then, if you're playing wiffle ball or stick ball or even baseball with too few players, you sometimes need to rely on imaginary runners to keep the game rolling. And they're sometimes called exactly that, imaginary runners, or maybe invisible runners, and often, yes, ghost runners. But these runners, the ones in extra innings in Major League Baseball, are not really ghost runners. They're actual corporeal human beings. And so some people, and I'll include myself among them, feel like ghost runner is not the right term of art. Back in 2021, the Athletics' Jason Stark ran down some alternate options, among them runners of shame, the running man, gift runners, free runners, and rerunners. And then there were the two most popular options, according to Stark. One of them was coined by Cincinnati Reds statistician Joel Luckhaupt in honor of the commissioner who put the, whatever you want to call it, into place. And that term is the Manfred Man, Stefan. Manfred Man, after the Earth Band. Yes, an homage to the fellow behind Manfred Man's Earth Band. What's not to like? Eh, Actually, I don't really like it. I think it's just a little too cute. Um, So that leaves us with another contender, the zombie runner, a term that seems to have been invented by Dan Simborski of Fangraphs. Simborski's explanation, ghosts are kind of ethereal. Zombies are reanimated corpses. So zombies make more sense. Zombies were gotten out previously, but then used as a base runner after they were revived. Not bad. But I think, again, it's maybe a little too clever to become an official term. Um, the kind that would get used in a news story or a baseball broadcast. I think the best option is something that I came up with and then Google <laughs> to find that a whole bunch of other people had also come up with it, so I can't <laughs> claim credit, unfortunately. But it is in kind of the same spirit of some of those um, Jason Stark terms that I read before, like gift runner and free runner. It's to call them unearned runners. Oh, And unearned really is the key element here, that these men get placed on base without having to do anything. And they're not, like, reanimated. That's not exactly a precise description of the phenomenon. The key element, they get placed on base, they don't have to do anything. And the phrase unearned run is already a part of baseball parlance, which, yes, could be a recipe for confusion. But, Stefan, if it's the right phrase, then it's the right phrase. And if the unearned runner scores, it actually is an unearned run. The pitcher is not charged with giving up that run. So you support it? Yeah. I do think it's good, actually. I think it's really good. Yeah. All right. Rob Manfred, let us know. Uh, That is our show for today. Our producer is Kevin Bendis. Listen to past shows and subscribe or just reach out. Go to slate.com slash hangup and you can email us at hangup at slate.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. For Stefan Fatsis, I'm Josh Levine. Remember Zelmo Beatty. And thanks for listening. Now it is time for our bonus segment for Slate Plus members. And Stefan, uh, remember the Super Bowl? I do. It was what? A week ago? Two weeks ago? Do you remember the Super Bowl from uh, two years ago? No. Or from last year? Was that the one that the uh, the Buccaneers won? Uh, the Bengals were in it, and they lost to the Rams. I just, right, had, to, I just had to dig that. See? Dig Told that out you. of my brain. Yeah. Um, these things don't matter. But let's pretend that let's pretend that they do. This Super Bowl was the most important events and the entirety of uh, human endeavor. All of uh, life was leading up to this. And then at the very end, it kind of fizzles out because there's this holding penalty at the end. Yeah, it was a holding penalty. We all agree, etc. But then, as I argued last week, it led to the annoyance of the final kind of few minutes of the clock just dwindling with uh, kneel downs and then a final field goal. Is there a better way? 
And remind me what, what you thought of that, Stefan. We know what Joel thought. What did you think, Stefan? What did I think about the ending of the game? I thought it was really unsatisfying. It was unsatisfying. All right. I'm not some football truther like Joel. Everyone can imagine what, what Joel would be saying here. So, all right. I, I said what I said, et cetera, and so forth. You all heard it or you didn't. Either way. I got a message from my friend Jordan Ellenberg, former math columnist at Slate, author of two amazing books uh, about math, a really smart guy, um, and a good friend. So Jordan had a couple of thoughts, a couple of suggestions. And, you know, we need to take these, these seriously. It's a time, national time of crisis. He said one option, one idea. Why should you be allowed to take a knee in football at any, at any uh, time, not just in the last two minutes of the game? Why should you be allowed to take a knee? Maybe it should be a 10-yard penalty, just like intentional uh, grounding as a penalty. Intentional kneeling intentional as a penalty. Kneeling, yeah. What do you think of that, Fatsis? Intentional kneeling. I like it. Change the rules. If, you can put, if we can put unearned runners on second base we can uh, and ban the shift, we can ban kneeling. I think there's a parallel there with the shift. You're banning a common play that teams have exploited to make the game duller. Get rid of that shit. <laughs> wow. I wasn't expecting you to work blue there, but it is the bonus segment. <laughs> It's a subject that, that really I, demands some passion. I have, a, I have a twist for you. Yeah. Jordan then, subs, then wrote me back and actually... That was just a teaser of our Slate Plus segment this week. If you want the whole thing, not just this week, but every week, you need to be a member. Sign up at slate.com slash hangup plus. That's slate.com slash hangup plus.